here. Autumn, not far away now. I suppose you could say it's been a quiet August. August, supposed to be hot and sunny, but it very rarely is. So I'm just going to do a sketch of some of the um, flowers and leaves and things that are around at the moment, all going into their later stages before the winter, before the autumn, first of all arrives. So let's see what we can do. I think mm, I'll start with a butterfly over here. a very soft pencil, um, well it's a 4B, um, because I think it's actually easier to draw with a soft pencil, especially if you're drawing on watercolour paper. You don't have to really put any pressure on the paper. a couple of references so if you see me creaking my chair or reaching over that's because I'm just uh, reaching for my reference material I sometimes use um, book covers as a uh, reference material and I have one here the therapeutic garden by Donald Norfolk that's a book I don't know 20 years old or so it's all about the benefits of gardening I think I can understand the benefits of having a garden, but I would sooner somebody else looked after it. I've got plenty of ideas, but not enough strength or energy anymore to garden, really, I'm sad to say. Also, I don't know if anyone else has got this, but I have a, a kind of um, mold allergy. I'm drawing a clematis flower here, um, which um, is made worse by digging in the garden because there's so much mold in the soil, isn't there? That's going to be mauve. Blackberries.
Don't know whether you have blackberries in uh, in the States. Sure, sure you do. You must have cultivated ones anyway, if not wild ones. They're one of the great joys of the English and the French, North France anyway, countryside. You can go and grab them out of the hedgerows. We've always got a few pots of blackcurrant jam in the larder. Going to come in with a couple of oak leaves here. Brittany is um, a great part of the world for the oak. We've got quite a few in our garden. And they have obviously these acorns which drop in the autumn and uh, the sheep absolutely adore them when you let them into the field where the acorns have been falling they go crazy for them they really like them the oak leaves obviously have these very indented um, edges. One year we had so many acorns fall and it was before we had the sheep and in the spring they all grew and the whole field was full of baby oaks. Insane. <laughs> Put a dragonfly here. Because it's not quite winter yet or even late autumn, there's a few um, flowers still on the black currants. Have some honeysuckle which has got petals like that
I think we'll put a a bee there. Here we'll just have a daisy. I'm just trundling along on the ground here. We'll pop in a little snail. And this is Ivy. With its characteristic three pointed leaves. Now, when we come to paint this, I'll probably end up inking it. Let's see how it goes. Some of those um, papery things that uh, grow dry at this time of year. I can't remember what they're called. Mm. 
And then down here we could have some honesty. That would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Those papery leaves, these are papery too. just coming up here we'll have a uh, dry seed head from a poppy. Maybe we'll have two. Here too. And then, um, what should we put here? be here heading off in this direction and we'll leave a space in the middle perhaps for some kind of slogan or motto we might write something in the middle there or you could even if I don't. So we're going to do this in kind of autumnal colours. So let me think. We want burnt sienna. We need um, olive green, I think, to make it easier. some quinacridone gold and we will want I think alizarin crimson alizarin crimson uh, can't quite tell if that's what this is yes that's alizarin crimson with a bit of purple in it and um, to help us with our greens and things, we'll take the um, cobalt blue. Or oh, ultramarine, I can't quite lay my hands on the cobalt at the moment, so perhaps I'll just use ultramarine. 
we might want Potter's pink. We might want some dark brown. That's Van Dyke brown. So those are the colours that we're using. Get rid of that. And we need a little bit of palette space. And I think I'll use my water brush today. Is here. Ah, there's the cobalt. It's over there in the photo shoot. So I have a choice now. I can either use one or the other. So. And we need our piece of toweling to dab the brush on in between different colours. And uh, let's check if we've got any water in here. No, it's pretty empty. I'll just grab my clean water. there although we won't need much of it because we're using a water brush and the color so the color palette is these ones here basically I'm going to be using this as a kind of color guide there's a quote on the back of this um, jacket book jacket it says by someone called John Clare who wrote something a poem called I Am and it says I long for scenes where man has never trod a place where a woman never smiled or wept there to abide with my creator God and sleep as I in childhood sweetly slept untroubling and untroubled where I lie the grass below above the vaulted sky which is rather lovely so we will start with, let me see, let's start with the green because we want to start with, I think it's probably easiest to start with the leaves. And whatever green you're using, if you want to make it more autumnal, then you would probably want to add a little bit of burnt sienna. Now this is the first time of using this water brush for me with um, with autumn colors and doing this kind of thing because this is a new a new um, experience. So we'll see how it goes but I'm going to be using my same the same technique that I always use. Uh, which is, as you can see, it's easier to see than it is to describe, really. Um, now, if I remember rightly, blackberry leaves are often, often on the reddish side, so that adds a little bit more colour to the side here where where the blackberries are, that adds, well not colour, it's all colour, but a little bit more warmth, that's the word I was looking for. If you put just a little dash of red into the green. And then the blackberries, of course, um, <clears throat> this time of the year they're not really quite ripe, so they're on the green side. And they vary. We've got a bush just not far from the studio here and uh, this time of year they vary. Some of them are quite green and some of them are quite edible, that is to say. Dark 
red, purple, like that. These little flowers might be on the pink side. Now the this butterfly up here, we're going to do that one in a sort of background is going to be sort of beige like that. I'm going to keep it really simple and I'm going to put a dark brown in the middle for his body and then I'm going to drop dark brown on the outer edge like that and we'll let that bleed. Then this plant here is a very dark blue with a touch of red so we'll that colour in there, which makes a nice contrast with that green, doesn't it? And then the reverse edge, which is turned up, is going to be lighter, so I'll just put some water in there and let that bleed. And then we'll go back to the stem Put the stem all the way up there and then the leaves. So when you're using whichever brush you're using, just press down, start at the top, that's to say the pointy end, and um, just press down to release the water. We could, we could put, as you go along, if you feel you want to add more, you can, can't you? You can just add another stem and then pop in another bud if you feel you want to, like that. Maybe another leaf going that way, perhaps. And I think we'll do the... Um, Dragonfly next, and we'll do it in a kind of rusty yellow. Like that, and then we'll do his his body in brown, just putting in the segments like that. here we've got the oak leaves which at this time of the year are still definitely green lovely dark rich dark green the oak is always late losing their leaves you go along and you're doing something like this just vary the greens every time you do a leaf you know just change the color that you're using at least once I think when I'm when I'm doing a botanical like this I tend to use ready mixed greens when I'm doing other paintings it depends on what sometimes I use no green at all I just um, use uh, 
a blue and, and, and yellow of some sort to mix the green, but when you're doing a lot of green, sometimes it's easier if you just have a, one ready mix, and I quite like olive. Olive green is good. This is uh, Van Dyke brown, or it could be burnt umber, um, and I'm just doing the cups of the um, acorns, and then the actual acorn itself I'm going to use burnt sienna. So there's another ready mix brown burnt sienna. And we have another oak leaf here. So all of each one of these is different. And that's what makes your painting look professional, just by varying the colour. colours of the uh, things in it, in your painting. Um, now the honeysuckle is going to be a sort of yellow colour, so we'll use quinacridone gold for that. And then we want a little bit of pink dropped in, so I'm going to use Potter's Pink for that, keep it nice and soft. And Potter's Pink has a, a granulating effect, so that gives texture. But if you haven't got it, you could use Permanent Rose or even Alizarin Crimson, very well watered down. Got a little bee sitting up there looking as if he wants to be painted. So we'll take a very dark colour, first of all, for his head, and then one segment, and then the second segment. And the colour I picked up there is probably a little bit of black and some ultramarine, which is fine, and we'll let that dry a little bit. But meanwhile, while it's drying, we'll just make sure my brush is nice and wet and I'll just pull out the wings like that. And then we want some thick quinacridone gold for the rest of the body like that. And we let that bleed. Don't fuss with it. Paint in the legs and we'll put the antennae in later. Okay, so then for the honesty up here, we want basically blue because it's more or less transparent, that stuff, isn't it? And that's about as close as we're gonna get. I think, I think if I remember rightly, I'm making this up because I don't, there isn't any in my reference material, so I'm just, I think it has kind of, I don't know, something like that going on. Oh, mustn't forget my tea. Hmm. I think I had a little bit too much water on my bee there. I'm going to just block that. Just blot him down like that and then when he's dry I'll correct him and leave him like that for now. And okay, so down here we have some daisies or something like a daisy. So just pop the stems in first. And then in my reference material, it's got a sort of orangey yellow center. So some nice strong quinacridone gold will do that fine. Don't need anything more complicated than that. And then we need a little bit of very pale blue. Doesn't matter if it's um, cobalt or ultramarine. And then we're just going to put some 
indications of the petals there. Just the shadows now. Oh, look what's popped up here. There's a snail. We'll paint him a reasonably nice dark colour. Bit of quinacridone gold in there, perhaps. And then his body, on the other hand, is more brown, dark brown. There we are, he looks quite nice. Should we put a leaf underneath him? He's probably wanting to crawl on the leaf. And, um, okay, so the, uh, up here, what have we got? We've got a very nice dark red. Red and purple. Red, purple, not red and purple. A dark red, um, clematis. Is that clematis or? I think it is. And that's going to have some quinacridone gold popped into the middle of that. And there's another one up here, so we'll do this one a little bit lighter. And here we have those um, things I can't remember the names of. What are they called? Using cobalt blue and um, potter's pink. The stems are probably going to be on the brown side. So I'm going to pop those in. I think they're a good autumn thing. So the leaves on that are probably going to be going brownish. And uh, come in again with that. And down here, this has still got green leaves. And then the ivy is very much this colour. And if we want to make it a little bit darker, we can add some of that purple to the base. And the stems. If you want to darken the bottom edge, just drop it in. Then when that's dry, we can add an, well, when it's nearly dry, we can add a, a light a yellowish color around the border because um, some ivies are variegated. So if we want to do a variegated one, we can do it like that.
and I think the variegation would be, I don't know if this is going to work, I think it might. Just a little bit of quinacridone gold. And then the, um, oh look, there's another bee. Let's see if I can get that one right. I think I put the yellow in too soon. That was the thing. So I'll wait with that one. It seems to be dry now. So we come back with the quinacridone gold. Now I'll restrain myself and wait before I put the black in the middle. And um, on this ivy, I think ivy has quite pronounced veins. So while that's wet, you can just draw in with a cut credit card and I recommend an Ikea card. They seem to work best. You can do that with all of your um, leaves if you want to do that while they're still wet. Okay, so we'll put quinacridone gold in there, for the centre of that. And then we have um, the poppy heads, which are going to be a sort of dark blue. this mm, put a little bit of quinacridone in there for the bottom of that and the stems and then maybe that's um That's um, Van Dyke Brown mixed with Ultramarine. And we'll just put some vertical lines like that. And now we are back to Ivy. Another way you could do it, you could start with the lighter color. That is probably a more efficient way of doing it. And then put the dark green in on top. And then fetch your IKEA card for the veins. And then here we've just got, I don't know what I was planning to do with this, but it obviously needs something on it, doesn't it? We'll put some leaves on there. I think we could probably get away with another one of these purpley flowers. This is just some leaves. Okay, well, we're nearly done. We need to fix this B. So that's the end of that stage. And now I'm going to uh, I'm going to try to find my 
ink pen. Set. No. So we're popping the antennae for these critters and the legs for that one. And if you want to give, you don't have to, it doesn't absolutely have to have any kind of line, but you can obviously put in a lot more detail if you come in with a pen. Things like the little dots on the acorn cups, which you can't very easily do with, with paint. And if you feel you've made a mistake, you can often correct the mistake or you can correct the shape. Um, yeah, you can do lots of things. You can put the stamens on the inside of something. Because I've done this quite small, obviously, uh, the details are hard to paint in, so it's easier to use a pen if you want to do that, but you don't have to. And then here, I think it would be nice to write a slogan, something like um, Quiet August or whatever you felt like writing. Today I'm going to be drawing um, some pumpkins and I'm going to paint them in some lovely bright fall colours because I think it's time for a little bit of autumn cheer since, uh, since it's been so chilly. Um, it seems only reasonable that we should get to enjoy the wonderful colours that, that autumn brings along with it, doesn't it? So I'm, I've sketched in the outline of one uh, pumpkin here and I'm just filling in the lines that show where the ribs and so on are. This one over here is going to be a little bit um, uh, bigger and uh, so we'll have that one coming around like that and uh, most of the details will come in when we actually come to paint it. But uh, I'm sure all of you are far more familiar with the shape and the type of pumpkins that you get. Because in America, I know they're much more common and more popular and important culturally um, than they are in, in Europe. Although I must admit in England nowadays, although I'm not in England, I'm in France, which is another story altogether. Um, when you go into the supermarkets around about this time of year, you are confronted by large uh, crate loads of orange, almost inedible pumpkins. Anyway, uh, so there's the stalk and the nice, it, they remind me of sort of, um, I don't know what you call them. Uh, we used to call them puffs. When I was a child, we used to have these things that we put our feet on in the front room and they were shaped a bit like this. Well, actually my mother used to call them puffies. Uh, that was London, working class London slang. Get the puffy out, Diane, will you? Okay, so that's, the noise in the background is the kitten doing his 40 laps of the room. 
Um, let's put a leaf here. A maple leaf, why not? Arthur, really? <laughs> and uh, let's have another one up the back here. Maybe another one over here. Okay, so there's our sketch. Um, and I'm going to start off painting these uh, pumpkins with cadmium orange. And I'm just going to be dropping in some cadmium orange all the way around, allowing it to vary a little bit in terms of strength. But just basically getting a, an orange color for the basis of the pumpkins. And this, this uh, Kuretake water brush is really perfect for this because it, um, it has a nice flat uh, set of bristles and um, it puts the color on really well. So that's, that's great. I'm really enjoying using this brush. Okay, so now I'm coming in with the second pumpkin, the same color, and uh, we'll make it a little bit darker here where it comes up against the other one, which is quite light. And we'll just get this in and then I'm going to, after I've got this coat in, I will let it dry. Just keep the brush strokes nice and free. Don't need to worry too much about any kind of accuracy. Stay roughly within the lines. Um, and then the one in the front again, which will probably be the brightest one when it comes to it. And we'll just keep the, keep the strokes nice and free. Following the line of the actual shape of the pumpkin. So going round like this all the time. And then I'm going to uh, consider now the um, maple leaf in the background here. I'm going to give him a undercoat of quinacridone gold. I should have mentioned the paints I'm using. I'm using um, White Knight, St. Petersburg, colors here for the cadmium orange. And then I've got um, Schmincke Quinacridone Gold, which I'm going to use for the first layer of the, the maple leaves. And just pop that in without any particular aim in mind, except to make it golden. It's a different color from the cadmium orange. So we've got some kind of contrast in the base tones there. And maybe we'll put um, a little bit of that in the, the stem area, which we'll darken down with some green, but we'll put the yellow in first. There we are, and kidoki. drying fairly quickly. Um, so the next thing is to think about where the lines, the shadows are coming down, I suppose. And we'll use um, the same orange. I just need a palette to mix in, on or around. So we take some of our cadmium orange and we're going to make it a bit darker. So um, we can use burnt sienna for that probably, if I can find it, burnt sienna. Hmm, that burnt sienna doesn't seem to be doing too well. So let's see what else I can find. Oh yeah, that's better. Mm -hmm. 
So if we paint in these lines, like that, then clean the brush and just wet, go in wet, let the whole thing run. And now some more orange. And then if we mix the orange with a very dark green we can put some green in the center there and clean off our brush soften this a bit Okay, that's, uh, that's fine. So then we're going to come in and do exactly the same thing on the next one. Uh, that was brown, so we want some brown. That might be a bit too dark. And then the orange. This cadmium orange is ideal for pumpkins, has to be said. And just dropping in a bit of water here to make that soften. So we've got the light area on the top of the pumpkin where the, the sun is hitting it. And then we'll let that dry. Maybe just put a little bit more orange in there, straighten that out a bit. Then same again here, let's come in with some light brown. And then the orange, lovely and bright, nice and strong. Squeeze your water brush as you come in with that so that it gradually weakens it as it goes round. Then you can add a bit more and it will run in and beautifully blend. And then you want to just keep squeezing the water brush to give you plenty of water so you can lift that out. And then we want a bit more around the bottom edge.
Okay, so we need to leave that to, to dry a little bit. We'll just pop in something there for the centre so we can see what we're up to. And then with this green, this kind of sludgy green that we've got, we could just come into our autumn leaf, leaf and give it a second coat now with the green and some oranges and the quinacridone gold. Yeah, the green in contrast to the orange there. Not too much green, but we want a nice contrast there. And then the quinacridone gold. And then we do the same over here. A little bit of green on this side contrasting with the orange of the pumpkin. And you could at th that point, you could come in with your um, sharp implement, either a glass pen or something similar, and you could do the veins on the leaves like this, and they'll show up because wherever you scratch a line, it makes an indentation, and then you get a darker line coming up in terms of shadow. And what I'm gonna do at the moment now is just let that dry and come back in with the background next and some details. Okay, I'm going to put a little bit of shadow in on the uh, stem here. I think I might use the smaller water brush. Just add some, just some shadow there for the minute. And um, uh, I am going to add some bright yellow, uh, orange, to the pumpkin. I'm going to add some transparent orange from the Viviva pal palette now. This is uh, saffron from Viviva, and it's a completely transparent color, so it just goes right over the top of everything that we've put underneath and just brightens it up very intense, which is exactly what you need for pumpkins, I think, to be fair. And uh, then I think we'll probably do the same over here. Keep the uh, strokes nice and nice and loose.
And then the front one here too, same deal. Maybe we'll put a bit of vermilion in there too, as well as the saffron. Beautifully transparent. Okay, and then um, because we've got these um, maple leaves, this is a bit of a Canadian theme going on here with the maple leaf, isn't it? And put some green in on this side here. some orange there of Mr. Pitt. And uh, yeah, we come in here again with some orange. And then some darker browns. in there to just give some odd shapes, bleed a little bit. And now um, I'm going to start thinking about the background a little bit. And um, for the background, I'm going to take my black tulip cat's tongue brush and just wet the background area. I've got a line in here, which is the line of, the, let's say they're on a table. So that's the line of the, where the table is. So I'm just wetting up to there, first of all. And then I'm going to do a sort of black, background in kind of greens. So we just go in here to our sludgy green colors and just drop some of that in. And we'll go a little bit blue on the mauve side too, as we get closer to the greenish stems, just to give us some contrast. And just keep this really loose. You want the, uh, what's the word? The the contrast of the purple with the green and the orange is, is very good. So that's the first layer there. And then the second thing is to come in around the foreground. And so we're going to do the same thing exactly. So just make it wet. And I think the same, uh, the quinacridone magenta, just dulled down a little bit with green, so it's not too Purple, that gives you a kind of brownish colour. And then we'll put that between the pumpkins, the leaves. The only bit where you really need to be a little bit careful is to preserve the shape of the pumpkin, which is it's that characteristic shape. Mm -hmm. 
the um, cat's tongue is quite good for that. Because it's got this nice point. And the colour should run reasonably well. On the wet paper. And just make sure we got that horizon line roughly level on both sides. It's not exactly a horizon, it's the table. But... Okay, and now we let that dry. Okay, so that's more or less dry and I'm just going to come in now with a few little bits of um, darker colour to just uh, accentuate some of the shapes. And uh, I'll play with that a little bit. And then shortly I'll show you the final painting. And uh, yeah, this is uh, an interesting experiment in color. The contrasts are great. The purple against the orange, the orange against the green and so on. You'll have fun with that, no doubt. So today I think with uh, Halloween coming and all the uh, fall celebrations, um, it's a good idea to do something a bit pumpkin-y and a bit whimsical. So this is... Uh, the last painting I did of pumpkins, which um, I'm starting from that as my inspiration. And uh, this is the sketch I've done this morning, uh, which I put on the community post for you to see. And uh, this is my basic um, imagination, two pumpkins with a nest of mice living in and around and some birds as their friends. So I've been drawing that out and on a fairly large piece here of Fabriano Artistico paper. And this is about how big? Um, I decided to give myself a nice lot of space because I wanted to make sure that the mice came out bigger so I could draw them properly. So this is about hmm, 18 inches by about 14 inches. And the picture is going to be kind of like that. Um, but anyway, so it's nice paper. It's um, Artistico, um, which uh, Fabriano Artistico, which is quite white. You can see the difference between the white and the creamy colour of this other alternative paper that I'm not going to use. I just use that for sketching. So yeah, so um, I'm going to. I've, I've sketched most of it in pencil, and I'm going to just draw a little bit of it in ink now. Um, for you to see and but I'm not going to do all of that because then I'm going to come back in and paint it um, and I think it's more interesting probably for you to see it being painted than than drawn and it's going to take a bit of a while so so I'm going to do that I'll start off with maybe with this pumpkin here and I'm using a Stettler pigment liner 0.03 I did pick up the two but it's um, dried out a bit so I'm using three and I'm sure that will be fine and the reason I'm doing this in pen and ink is because um, it's actually easier, I think, if you have an outline uh, of, a, of a thing like this when it comes to painting it. Um, I find it's actually quite a bit easier. You can paint more loosely, in other words, if you've got uh, an outline. We just um, harvested our grand total of four big red pumpkins today. Tamsin has been growing them. Last year we had about 20 or more. We had a huge number and we couldn't, 
It was a bit daunting because we couldn't possibly eat more. So we stored as much as we could and unfortunately we did lose quite a lot of them um, to <coughs> various other life forces such as mice and mold and fungus and so on. But uh, we, I've still got some of it in the freezer which we probably ought to eat. Okay, so up the top here we have got um, just referring to my sketch, we've got Mother Mouse and she is knitting a woolly jumper or a scarf for one of her relations. She probably should have a pair of glasses on. See about that. It's got little hands. And um, let me see knitting needles. Some knitting. And she's sitting sort of cross-legged. Little feet there. <clears throat> Don't need to do too much detail, we can put the detail in when we come to do the colours. <coughs> and then we've got a hole down here that somebody has excavated. There's a little mouse here, and he is drinking a nice cup of tea. So there we are, and I'll just carry on like that until the whole thing's done. And uh, if you want the sketch when this is finished, if you decide you like it, then it'll be available for you to download on the website, dianantom.com. <clears throat> okay, so I'll be back in a second when that's all been drawn. So here I'm going to be swatching out the colors I'm going to be using for this particular <coughs> painting the palette and um, I've decided to um, what would we say to <clears throat> um, soften or tone down the traditional idea of um, fall colors which would be technically tr traditionally sort of very golden brown kind of colors like that and then a fairly bright uh, green that's, that's not what I mean, I mean this kind of green. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to blue these down a little bit. So I'm going to take turquoise and olive green and mix that to give me a bluish, a bluish green like that much softer than this and then for the orangey colors I'm going to use quinacridone gold as usual plus burnt sienna and those will obviously mix some of the time then I'm going to be using some Van Dyke brown or you could use sepia for some of the shadowy areas and for the red I think I'll use mainly Potter's pink which is a soft red. When I say red, I mean for the berries, with a little bit of, um, I think this is permanent rose or alizarin crimson as well. So that's, that's basically the palette there. 
And um, so now I'm going to get rid of this. And I've got my colours. Oops, what's that? Some words. <clears throat> I've got my colours here on my butcher's tray. And um, because I'm using a big piece of paper, I don't want to totally mess it up. So um, right, so here's the drawing. And I might add a few more leaves as I go along. It depends. And now what I've got to do is decide uh, who I'm going to start with. Am I going to start painting the mice first? Or am I going to paint pumpkins first? And I think probably what I'll do is I probably will start with the pumpkins. And I'm going to, because then they can be drying while, um, for their first layer and while I then get on with the mice. So I'm using, I'm going to put a light color underneath. And this is quinacridone gold. And I'm using my Kuretake water brush. Um, another company called uh, Poetique sent me yesterday a big box of watercolour filled uh, water brushes. So 96 of them and they're similar brushes to these but they aren't as good and so when I'm suggesting to you you might want to try water brushes I do think that probably needs proviso, needs the uh, qualifying comment that uh, they're not all, all, um, all water brushes are not made equal. And this Kuretake one is very good. But the one that, from Poesy, I couldn't make it work really. It was dropping a lot of water all over the place. So, um, not so impressed with that. Okay, so a bit of shadow there behind that one. So that's just the undercoat of that particular one and we'll come, go ahead and do the, this one too, the similar. I could have done one of the pumpkins in a different set of colours, for example, greys or blues, because I think they do come in those colours too, don't they? Um, but I thought, well, I've got a lot of colour in the mice and the other things as well, so... Just stick with the one. Okay. And then, what shall we do next? Um, let's get some green. And do these little leaves. And then we make that a little bit browner for the stalk, the twig. Be a bit browner still. Not quite that brown. If you want to put a bit of shadow on in places, just pick up some darker brown, a little bit thicker, and just drop that in. in in places and let it run and then if you want to put a little bit of shadow on the leaves just drop a little bit in at one end and let that bleed okay so now 
Let's do these nice oak leaves. I'm going to drop in some or uh, quinacridone gold. Burnt sienna, lots of it. A nice dark brown. And then some green. And we let that run. Same here. And then I do like doing acorns. They're still green here, where we are. So what I'm going to do is drop green in on the top and let the brown run up. Okay, um, I've got a pine cone over here. So we'll just pop in some brown. And then we have a maple leaf, so we'll make that nice and, again, quinacridone to start with. Then I'm going to drop in some red. A bit more quinacridone. Maybe a bit of green. A bit more quinacridone. A bit more red. This oak, same thing. Okie dokie, so then we've got some leaves here. I think that's more or less dry, we'll be able to go back to that in a minute. Mm, a little bit of brown in there. I'm going to do the berries last. Um, okay, so this wants to be a little bit darker. I think. What do you think? It's up to you, really. And then... Let us see. Quinacridone, gold and burnt sienna. And plenty of water. Mm. 
And if we want to delineate the shape a bit, just drop in some stronger raw sien burnt sienna on those lines that I drew. And we might put some shadows underneath. greenish because oh yes I forgot there was a to go with the uh, uh, pine cone okay so we've got the mice which are going to be the hardest things this one we're going to keep lighter and I'm going to come in with some green. Just some light. Uh, that was uh, olive green. Watered down with a bit of turquoise. Probably want a little bit darker up here. So I'm going to have to let that dry for a minute and then I'll come back and do the, the, the family of mice. Okay, so I'm going to have a go now at painting the uh, mummy mouse up here. And I'm um, just going to lay in a light wash pretty much everywhere. This is very dilute uh, sepia and then we'll come in with a little bit of Potter's Pink, the insides of her ears and uh, we'll just let that dry and then we'll do the same down here for this chap. This is um, Van Dyke Brown which is a slightly different colour. And um, we give him Potter's Pink on the inside of his ears too. Let that sort of blend into his head. This one here, same, I've got pink ears. And I'm going to give him sepia again with a little bit of Van Dyke brown, so it doesn't really matter. Any kind of brown really diluted down is fine for the first coat. And um, we've got these little birdies up here, haven't we? Make them into robins. So now let's give him, is he dry? Probably, we'll give him a red scarf, shall we? Red and white stripes make him a Manchester United fan. And then the cups. What color should we make those cups? don't want them to be too different from everything. I think I'll make this one green. And make this one purple, perhaps. Now 
we're going to come back to uh, Mrs. Mouse with some Van Dyke Brown, a bit darker. And we'll just put in some shadow, some darken areas on her body. You can build that up as much as you like. And this one here, same thing, a little bit more dark. Packs of his ears, maybe we might want to make those quite dark. Same thing, start at the back of the head, darken up the backs of the ears, clean off your brush a little bit and sweep that down. Just keep it nice and light. And we'll make her scarf, she'll make her scarf red and white too, so she's knitting another one the other mouse. Okay, and then we just want some red berries. So we'll just drop in some red very lightly into the circles that we've done. And we might want to give them a bit of shadow, so we just do that with some purple. I've got a whole load of them here, I went a bit crazy. Very nice, this paper, Fabriano Artistico. to make the breasts of the birds a little bit stronger so I just come back and you can spend as much time as you like fiddling around and playing around with that you could come back in with the uh, pen and do some more line work emphasizing some of the features you could add a little bit more detail to some of the body work but I think basically I think that's probably done for now I'm going to do a painting today which is going to be autumnal, attractive, lovely warm colour. So first of all, <clears throat> what we're going to do is prepare a background. And um, I've got a piece of stretched watercolour paper here, um, which I think is Fabriano. It's Fabriano Artistico, which is nice and it's stretched. And um, you can see that how that's done in a video um, somewhere in the back catalogue. And I'm going to be using Burnt Sienna, um, Cobalt Blue, Windsor Violet and Quinacridone Gold for this background. Plus I'm going to use some salt and I'm going to use some um, Saran Wrap or Cling Film. And so first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the biggest brush I can lay my hands on at the moment, which is my Isabelle Petit Gris, which is um, a squirrel brush. And I'm just going to wet the whole surface of this piece of paper reasonably generously. And um, it should be okay. The, <clears throat> the, um, the paper is uh, pretty good at handling wet in wet, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. And in any case, this is all very, um, what's the word, Im impromptu <laughs> or whatever. Anyway, so now this is my Ron Ranson um, Pro Art Hake. Uh, a little bit nibbled around the edges here. One day I, I had a little bit of an impatient moment 
and um, I gave it a bit of a haircut. It didn't seem to make much difference. And I'm just going to drop a very liquid paint in. Don't try to control it. As soon as you, as soon as your brush touches the paper, um, hopefully you'll relax. Uh, I try to do that and uh, just let it let it go. I'm going to put some violet in the middle. I'm rather hoping that we're going to have some nice um, shadows because this is going to have, um, I hope, a um, spider's web in the middle. So let's put the quinacridone gold in here and put a bit up here too. I think we want some more violet. I'll just wash my brush out. This is one of those, the kind of thing that you can't really control. You have absolutely no idea how this is going to turn out. That's the whole point. So we put some more of that there. a bit more blue perhaps a bit of uh, this is core phalo blue which has a very interesting relationship with other colors so I'll just pop a bit of that in just for the heck of it see how it goes okay now <clears throat> then we will um, put some salt don't forget, watercolour always dries lighter. So we'll put some coarse grain salt. See how it's sucking up the paint, the pigment goes in. <clears throat> and then we'll get some fine, fine grain salt and chuck that on. And you can see that doing an interesting spattery, wattery thing. And the thing is, it doesn't really matter what this turns out like once it's dry because we're going to paint over the top of it anyway. So I have a piece of saran wrap. I stunt that up nicely. I discovered a while ago that uh, cling film works far better as a texturizer if you screw it up first. And the reason why I discovered that was because we used to um, give away a lot of eggs when we had a lot of chickens. And we used to give them away to my neighbor. And I used to give them to her on a flat tray, a tray, you know, an egg tray, not a box. So there was no top to it. And I used to wrap it up with killing film so that the eggs didn't fall out. And after she'd taken the eggs from me, a few days later, she would give me back the cling film, the saran wrap that she had taken off of the eggs. And she would roll it up onto a tea towel and then she would give me back the cling film rolled up on a tea towel and I'd have to then give her back the tea towel. So it sort of went backwards and forwards all the time. Anyway, so I ended up with a lot of crinkly cling wrap. And one day I was doing this and I happened to pick up the crinkly cling film and I used it instead of the regular stuff and it worked really well. So ever since then, ever since uh, Nicole's cling film ran, ran out and we've only got half the number of chickens now so we don't give away so many eggs. Anyway, well, that passes the time of day, doesn't it? Um, there we are, we're gonna leave that. You can see already it's starting to go a bit paler. Don't know what that's going to turn out like. But if that one doesn't fit the bill, which I think it probably will, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to um, there we go. That's better. Um, caught the air under there. I didn't put it down carefully enough, but that's fine now. 
Um, if that one doesn't work out, I'll use this one, which I did a while ago, and I haven't got around to using it yet, but that will be fine. And in preparation for the next step, let's get rid of that for the minute and put that over there somewhere flat to dry, because that will take all night to dry and you mustn't touch it, uh, it spoils it. So if that one doesn't work out, then we'll use this one, which is very similar. But it doesn't have any purple in it at the moment. And I've done my design here. Uh, yeah, I didn't do it on paper. I did it straight onto tracing paper. So when you're doing something like this, the way to do it, get yourself a piece of tracing paper or baking parchment or whatever you have handy, tissue will do. Um, and then you can use that to sketch onto so that you get the design right. Because what you're going to do is you're going to look for shapes that you can develop. So for example, here, I've got an area which I think will turn very nicely into the head of a, um, what do you call it, um, cow parsley. So I've drawn that in, indicated that. Here, this I think would turn very nicely, this shape, into a poppy seed head. So I've drawn the poppy in there. There's another one down here. And then I'm going to put another um, twiggy thing of cow parsley type thing up there. And then these shapes here, I'm going to turn those into leaves against the blue sky and the texture. And these other dots and things, they're like um, seeds or things floating around in the air. And then once I've got my scaffolding in place, so to speak, then I'm going to put in a couple of uh, spiders, spiders webs. And the reason why I wanted to try another one is I've put some purple in because I think the purple in the center might be nicer for the spider's webs, but it might not be. So we'll see how that one turns out. Um, as far as doing the spider's webs go, um, I'm going to use some white ink Winsor & Newton white ink, and I'm going to draw the spider's webs in um, using a pen, which I have here. This is just an ordinary dip pen. It's a cheap plastic handle with a fine nib. Anything would do, and or um, I might try using my um, glass pen, or I might use both. Either of those would work, as would also work a, a gel pen like this one, Sigmo. This particular specific one is getting a little bit tired, so that would this particular one wouldn't work very well because it's almost empty. But a new one would. It would do a good job, I think, of drawing the white lines. So at, alternatively, you could, of course, mask them out and then paint over and then rub away the masking fluid. But I think I would prefer to do it this way this time. So I'm going to go away now and wait for that to dry and then come back and then we'll draw the design onto the prepared background. Okay, so I'm back now after having waited all night for these uh, this to dry. And in the end, what I did was I did, I prepared three more of these backgrounds because I do use them quite a lot and um, they're useful for all sorts of things. So when you're on a roll, um, it's a good idea to, since you're mixing up large quantities of um, paint to do one background, I always find I feel like I want to do more than one. So that's what I did. And these are all roughly the same. You can keep the cling film for use again. And, um, then you take it off and then you can just scrape off the, the loose salt that sometimes slightly sticks to the paper. Um, and uh, I find that uh, an old Ikea card cut in half is a good, good uh, solution to that problem. Best thing you can do with an Ikea card. Um, says she, whose studio is entirely kitted out from top to bottom with Ikea furniture. Very utilitarian furniture, but very, 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 very useful. Um, anyway, so that's, that's that one. And um, that's interesting, isn't it? Because you can see already we've got some lovely stems here for dried um, stalks and uh, seed heads and all sorts of things going up into the sky. And it's very inspiring. Um, you've got half of your design there already 
prepared for you. So that's number one. And then this one had a bit more purple in it. And um, so that's, that's quite nice. It's a different, slightly different mood. So I'll just scrape off the salt from that too. Have a look at the video on um, paper stretching, which I'll put a link to that um, below. And also, if you take a look at our blog on the website, dianenton.com, you'll find that's linked to when you go to the blog for this particular painting. Um, and then the number, third one that I did yesterday is this one, which came out quite dramatic, quite dramatically. That's amazing, actually. I think that was the first one. Paper's come a bit loose there, so the salt's got down behind it, but it's not important. So there we are. So we've got those three to choose from. And um, also the one that I started with, which was that one, which has uh, probably got more autumnal color to it than the ones that I did afterwards. So I'm not quite sure which one to use now, really. Um, these are almost pictures on their own, aren't they? You could almost say, wow, that's an abstract landscape or something. Anyway, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to put those aside, the new ones, we'll come back to that and I'm going to go back to this one because I'd already started to do my design on there. Now to draw these in initially, I'm going to use watercolor pencils. And um, I have a set of watercolor pencils, which I'll just quickly show you here, which belongs to Tamsin. She's had this since she was about nine, which is longer than she cares to remember. It's a Faber-Castell Albrecht Dürer set and it's still not only in almost untouched condition, so she was not that much of a, an ah. Uh, <laughs> she was very, very careful and only used them very lightly. So that's great because now I can work my way through them. Um, anyway, so uh, what was I going to say? Yes, so they're quite old, but they still work fine. So to do this drawing on here, I'm going to use a watercolour pencil and the reason why is because if you use a watercolour pencil to um, do the drawing then when you come in with the watercolour you'll find that um, any lines will just melt away with the water. So now um, this, these pencils are too fat to go into my regular um, sharpener so I'm going to use my pencil plane for this. This was a birthday present from Tamsin. It's quite interesting. It's uh, made of brass and it's got a little screw knob there which holds this sharp blade in place. It's just like the sort of plane you use on wood, but tiny, obviously. It has a little optional case. And it, um, obviously you can sharpen any size of pencil. So, and it, it's very economical because it doesn't carve away so much of the, of the lead or the color because it just, well, it just sharpens it a bit. I find that wonderful. That's really a useful thing. So, um, okay, so let's see if I can draw this. Design. <clears throat> the tracing is just a kind of guide, really. I'm not going to uh, follow it exactly. So we'll just have to be brave and come in with some pencil sketches. And I thought I would have some move this for a sec. Um, cow parsley head up here. I'm not going to draw in all the details, just the basic 
outline. And then I thought this would be here a poppy head, poppy seed head. And then around here, I'm just going to follow that irregular line. I might do this with sponge, paint that with sponge, perhaps. And um, I think I thought there was a another seed head. Where was uh, there's that one there. And then um, we need some leaves. So we we'll just draw the outlines to the leaves. This could be kind of beech leaves there, perhaps. And then some of these circles could reinforce them a bit and they could be berries. So you could, I suppose you could say this was kind of abstract. I think that's a bit of a posh word, really. I'm going to put in some, I've got these mushrooms here. Uh, but what I'm looking for in my little box, it's not the mushrooms, but hazelnuts. Cool, aren't they? Oh, they're falling out. So, yeah, they have kind of And then I had some ivy, ivy leaves, they're rather nice. And maybe we'll put some ivy leaves over here, perhaps kind of overlapping. And then maybe we'll bring in some berries, some ivy berries over the top of this. some oak leaves down here perhaps or maple um, beech leaves are really good this time of year but I know that
A lot of you are really used to beautiful maple leaves. I'm not necessarily very good at drawing them, being as I'm from the other side of the planet. Um, okay, so let me see. Now what I wanted to do, according to my drawing here, was I needed a scaffolding. So this is the scaffolding. We have some more lines coming down here for some other seed head bearing thing and then a line coming down here. And then we need something coming up the middle at a different angle. Try to make it not the same angle as either of those. So it's going to have to go over there like that. This one's going to come down there like that. And then oh, I wanted another seed head so we could, could call this one a thistle rather than a poppy seed. We make this one into a bit of a spiky thistly thing. And then here we're going to put um, the a spider's web and we'll probably put another one up here somewhere. And bearing in mind Roland Hilda's uh, encouragement to not fill every inch of the paper with design, I'm going to leave this bit here empty and we'll see what happens when we get down that far. Okay, so as you can see, I've kind of followed that. And maybe we want one more of these down here. empty. Uh, now to paint this I'm going to use some colours from my Viviva colour sheets. This is a special um, set that we've had done in collaboration with Viviva and it's got our name on it. Diane Anton Studio. There's a set of 16 colours in here and um, at the back there's a little message from us encouraging you to relax, breathe and create and so on. And this is a wonderful thing for you to buy if you want to support us. Um, you can get it from our website if you just go to dianeanton.com. And um, I really like these colours because they're very strong, powerful colours and um, <clears throat> ideal for this kind of thing. So we're going to be using things like burnt umber, burnt sienna, vermilion and um, these kinds of colours. It's, it's not that when it comes out, it's much brighter than that, uh, obviously. So we will be working with those and possibly also with some of my regular paints over here. So I've got my Cobalt Blue, Windsor and Newton, um, Windsor Violet, Quinacridone Gold, Burnt Sienna, Potter's Pink, and so on, Olive Green. And you don't have to have these because these colours will certainly give you a good result. So let's pop all these vegetables away for a minute. And um, yeah, to do the painting, as far as brushes go, I recommend the uh, um, Zen Art Black Tulip set of six brushes, which you can get for 20 something dollars. They're pretty good for that price and they ship them worldwide. So you can go to our link to get those. I also use um, Drawwell Japanese golden brushes, which you can get direct from them. If you are keen enough to contact them direct, they will ship them to you at a very reasonable price. And that's great. I don't make any money out of that. Um, I'm also going to be using a Kuretake water pen, water brush. Um, which I find very easy to use and it's quicker, a little bit quicker. So for me, when I'm demonstrating, that's quite handy. I've got my jar of water at hand here, mason jar, a um, piece of toweling to wipe off my brushes on. And I think I'm 
think that's about it. So I'm going to take a breather and come back in a second and start with the painting. Okay, so I always have a piece of spare paper at hand to test out the colors that I'm going to use. And I'm going to start painting these leaves with vermilion. So that's what the vermilion looks like when it comes from the color sheets, which is a wonderful color. And I'm going to just drop that in using the water brush to a leaf shape, which I prepared earlier. And then I'm gonna pick up a little bit of my quinacridone gold and just add that in places. And then a little bit of Windsor Violet, which I'm just going to drop in a little bit like that. Then I'm going to take my um, Chinese, Japanese uh, bamboo pen and scratch in the veins like that. And then we'll just let that uh, mix and mingle a bit and we'll get a fairly realistic <clears throat> looking leaf based on this lovely vermilion colour, which is going to be a beautiful contrast to the blue. And you can add a little bit more of it if you want it to be really nice and bright, like that. And I really like putting a bit of a bit of purple in for a shadow. Sometimes I might come up the middle like that. And then here we could put a, a berry or two just overlapping like that. We finish that off later with some stems once it's, once it's dry. And uh, put another vermilion leaf down here. bit of quinacridone gold and you can you can sit down to do this carry on building it up sometimes you can put the quinacridone in first and remember that in nature most leaves aren't perfect in the sense of they they have bits missing and they have burnt bits, dark bits, eaten bits, bits that holes, stuff like that. So come away from the idea that it should be neat and tidy. That's ridiculous, okay. Doesn't look convincing. Maybe you don't want convincing, but um, anyway, so I'm just painting in some shapes that resemble leaves. With these three colors, because three colors, when they blend, they'll give you lots of lovely different tones and things. And if you just scratch in the veins when the paint is just sinking in and beginning to, to dry, what happens is the pigment goes into the indentation that you're scratching into the paper and you get either a light line or a dark line depending on exactly when you've scratched into it. Since we're working on uh, the vermilion -y type colours, I'm going to um, engage with a maple down here. Try to keep some of the nice blends that you had from your random randomness before. With the salt and everything. And you don't always want to do the veins and let the pencil show through from underneath too. You don't need to rub out the pencil, like we said before. Now, I'm going to do a little mixture of potter's pink and green for this 
stem here and it's going to go over the watercolor pencil like I said and it will um, make it soften up a little bit and then I'm going to take my ink. I've got some nice ink here, sepia ink. And uh, this is the way it goes. You, this is why you need all of your things at hand because you might decide you're going to do something a little bit different to what you had intended. So I've put the stem in there and I'm going to get my um, glass pen and then I'm going to just draw in, hopefully with the glass pen, some Um, some dried seed heads. I don't know quite why that's not working as well as it usually does. Oh, there we go. It's holding it on. And then I think we'll just blur that a little bit, pick up some of the extra that we had there. Okay, now um, let's do some of these berries in a nice bright red, nice clean bright red vermilion again from Viviva. Make them all different sizes. And then you can use your pen perhaps to oops, to just draw the stalks. This one too. I think I heard the coffee just finishing. Now if you just take a, a wet brush, you can go over these uh, watercolor pencil lines and just give yourself a nice um, soft faded stem there. You don't need to add anything at all unless you want to, and you could pop in a little bit of ink, perhaps in places, to darken it down here and there. Or we'll just leave it faint because it's in the background. I'm going to do another leaf here. I think I heard the coffee machine finishing, so I'm just going to pop over and get myself a cup of coffee. Okay, so um, I'm going to, I think I'll just do this thistle here and uh, try painting that in ink. start with. This gives us a nice brown. And um, I have uh, another little thing that I use a lot, which is my uh, Karat Aquarelle Stettler Karat Aquarelle watercolor pencil, which is really nice for making darks when something is wet, you can use this watercolour pencil to give you some very striking contrasts. 
And you see how dark that comes out. So for something like this that just wants to be highly contrasty, that's ideal, lots of texture. You can even dip it into the water to make it actually like a paint, paintbrush. So that's kind of fun. And now let me see. Oh, I need a quick slurp. Um, So a few more leaves up here we have. If you add Windsor Violet to Vermilion, you get a really rich chestnut brown, as you can see. And then you can use the violet again to give you shadow around the bottom edge, which will blend in really nicely. Then you come back again with some more vermilion and that will sit very satisfactorily next to it. Don't forget to scratch in your veins, which makes a big difference and is super fun. And if you, as I said, if you do it at the right moment, you can actually make it lighter rather than darker. Poppy head here. Let's get that ink again to do the this pen isn't working very well. I'm going to swap to a different one. Um got just a regular dip pen here. See how that works. On the other hand, let's try the mapping pen, which is here. Let's see whether that works any better. Now we want some nice, soft um, browns for the nuts here. And then they've got kind of green sort of hats. So we'll use some olive green and some quinacridone for that.
Another one of these like that down there. Some ink. And then some spiky bits using this pencil. Just to give us some nice darks. And that will dry lighter. And then I think we'll put some, some greens over here for these ivy leaves. This is olive green. Again, scratch in our veins. Maybe we'll put a nice bright leaf in here with the vermilion. Maybe one behind here too, perhaps up here. Carry that orange down a little bit. Sort of make it kind of just a general sort of oranginess. And this I was planning on making into a sort of, um, uh, oh, we did a seed head like that before where we did it with cotton buds. And um, I'm just wondering where my cotton buds are. Okay, I found them. Now I'm going to dip uh, the cotton bud into the sepia ink. And uh, then I'll just try it out a piece of paper to make sure it's okay. And then I'm going to just dot in some round things on here. And then I'm going to hope that this time the ink pen, the, the glass pen works, because what I want to do is come from the center out. I don't know why this pen isn't working. It just goes to show it was working very well until recently, and now it isn't. Strange, very strange. I'm wondering if it's the ink. Hmm. Okay, so we will improvise. I just want to make a sort of scratchy pattern. I don't care really what I do it with. So we'll do it with a pencil. And I want to do the same down here as well. So let me do this first, and then I'll do it with the pencil. I like this pencil anyway. I actually um, find drawing uh, more liberating than painting, actually. I like painting, but I also like drawing. 
Okay, so now we have got a what you might call border and I want to try to do the, um, the border, I mean, around the edges. And now I'm going to try and do the um, spider's web. And that I was planning to do with white ink. And I was planning to do it with my uh, glass pen. But glass pen seems to have gone on strike. with the mapping pen. We're going to have a I'm pretty sure this will dry okay. It's going to dry much lighter anyway. So it will just be a kind of effect. And I think I might, um, what might I do here? I want to make something a little bit more in the middle there. <clears throat> um, I think we could do a sort of splash of a thistle, a thistle tuft. Let's put a thistle tuft here and then some brown. I'm looking for a nice dark brown burnt umber. How about that? Let's see what that turns out like for the bottom of the thistle. a bit pinker. A little bit of um, magenta perhaps. Yeah.
and you can soften up some of these seed heads down here with some more shadowy bits like that and here too just put some water in onto the pencil and it gives it more strength then I want to put again some vermilion berries in here on top So we've got a nice lot of reds and browns. And, you know, you can add as much as you want to this. Keep going, stop, whatever. I'm feeling that that is a bit dark compared to the rest of it, so I'm just going to knock that back a bit with some white. And hopefully that will dry down a bit. At this point you have to stop and look and think whether or not you want to uh, change what you've done, add to it. I mean, I'm just doing this as I'm going along. I have no particular uh, exact plan ahead of time. So, you know, as you know, we came from a sketch and a vague idea. And at this point, um, I always find that I can't really see what I've done very well. So I have to wait a bit, come back in a few minutes and see, or even the next day and see whether I like what I've done, see whether I feel I need to add more to it or whether that would spoil things or whatever. And um, so that's where I am at the moment. So I'm going to stop for a bit, finish my coffee, come back and uh, wind up. Okay, so I think I'm going to call that done, except for the fact that I am going to add a little bit of spatter um, just to liven it up a little bit, and uh, especially there. And down here where we've got the more restful area, and maybe a little bit up here near to those um, dubris. And then what I quite like to do sometimes is just to break some of that spatter up and let that uh, just mix and mingle. Just to give the eye something restful to rest on. It's kind of combination of sharp and uh, in focus and out of focus. Yeah? That's the thing. So today I'm going to be doing yet another autumn themed painting because it is still October and as uh, Anne Blockley says in one of her books, October is the archetypal autumn month and uh, you know regardless of whether or not you live in England or France or anywhere in America it has to be said that in the northern hemisphere October is the month when we turn from thoughts of summer to th uh, thoughts of, of winter. Unfortunately, it's what happens, but summer says goodbye with brilliant colors and beautiful views of wonderful turning trees and berries. And you know, one of the things that I love the most about this time of the year is the number of young birds there are around. For us anyway, all the nests are empty and the baby birds are out there busily building up their strength for the winter on our bird table and everywhere else. We've got hordes of of baby collared doves and sparrows and all sorts of very ordinary but nevertheless wonderfully cheerful and beautiful birds so that's one of the joys of the autumn for me anyway. Another one of the joys of autumn well that's doing paintings which have got the warm colours of autumn in them and so I've been playing around this morning couldn't decide what to do I just got too many ideas too many possibilities um, but finally, I've settled on doing <clears throat> something with a background that I have previously painted and I've shown you how to do it a couple of times. But if you go back to the watercolor um, seed heads and so on, that was about a couple of weeks ago, um, you can see how I did the background. Um, this is me messing about with colors as I decide my palette. And um, the palette I'm going to be using today is we're going to be having olive green, quinacridone gold, um, cobalt blue, 
This is um, Old Holland Bright Red, and uh, that's obvious, that's for the berries and to make the yellows more like oranges. Not oranges, not that kind of orange, an orange color. Uh, and um, this is um, Potter's Pink for the texture of the granulation. And this is burnt umber and somewhere around here I should have sepia. There we go, we're having sepia too for the very dark areas. I may, uh, I might probably at the end use some ink. Um, so there we are, those are the colors that I was playing with. And the thing is, you want to limit your palette a bit. Um, don't have half a dozen different reds just because you're going to paint half a dozen different berries, for example. Just have one strong red and then you you can mute it or brighten it up by adding other colours to it rather than just saying, oh, I think I'll have a bit of this and I think I'll have a bit of this and I think I'll have a bit of this because by the time you've done that, everything starts to look completely chaotic and although some very, very skilled painters can handle massive palettes of different colours, I think that takes more skill than I'm prepared to try to develop or even demonstrate. It's just not for me. Anyway, what I also might use, and I don't know yet, is this, some of these selection of six colours from Daniel Smith, um, which I feel I ought to explore more because they are, firstly, they were a gift and secondly, they're not cheap. So they don't want to sit in their little box forever. And here we've got um, Rhodonite, Jadeite, Mayan Blue, Amethyst, Genuine, Piemontite, uh, Genuine, Hematite, and um, did I say all of those? Rhodonite? That's Rhodonite, so that's a pink. That's a brownish pink. This is almost black, that's purple. This is greenish blue, or bluish, blue, bluish anyway, and this is green and they all granulate really well. So they're quite fun if you're doing painting like this. So I may uh, incorporate some of those, possibly, we'll see. Because like everything else, although I know how to paint, I don't know how the paint's going to behave on this particular painting. So we'll put that over there for the minute. That's a, I did my try out on a piece of Baohong paper. This is a Chinese, Pure cotton watercolour paper, it says, probably made from recycled cotton fibres. Um, not as good as arches, not as good as, in my opinion, even not as good as um, Bockingford or De La Rowney Langton watercolour paper, or especially Clairefontaine Etival, all of which are made from cellulose and they're made well. And the sizing is good. So you can rely on that as practice paper. Do I sound very dictatorial there, sorry about that, but paper is one of those things I do tend to get a bit wound up about. Um, you don't need to pay a fortune for your paper while you're still learning to paint, but you do need to have something reliable. Anyway, what I've got here is stretched. It's, um, I think it's, this is, um, oh yes, this is, um, oh, what do you call it? Um, that Italian one, what's it called? Fabriano. That's Fabriano. Okay, so I did, like I said, I did the background beforehand and this has been sitting in my folder of, um, I will work on this later um, paintings, but looking at it this morning, I thought to myself, oh gosh, doesn't this look like a seed head? And um, We grew some fennel in the garden. And I just thought, hmm, that could be there, couldn't it? So he is going to be the star of the show, I hope, if he'll stay in the vase. Okay, so that's gonna go there. And then I thought I would put some chrysanthemums, some flowers down the bottom and, um, haven't got any further than that with the design, so let's get started. Um, oh yes, I'm going to use my Zen Art number no. eight black tulip paintbrush. That's going to be one of the ones I'm going to use. And what else? Um, 
I don't know, I might grab something else as we go along. We'll have to see how it goes, because I'm not quite sure where to start really. So let's see. I suppose really the best thing to do would be to put the seed head in first. So I need something, I, uh, I need a pencil, I need a pencil, here we are. So this is a cool thing, isn't it? I don't know if you can still buy these. It's got this lead in the middle, big fat lead. Can't get it out now. Anyway, it's fun to draw with. So it's pretty clear that that's the top edge of this thingy. So we'll sketch in the stem and then you go, you go over there. And then we need to uh, How many has it got? Lots. Um, far more than we need. So there we are, and then lots of dots on the end of each of these. Some are shorter, obviously they seem shorter because they're nearer, and some are further away. So I'm not going to draw all those in with a pencil, but just to give myself a bit of a guide. And then maybe um, maybe we want another stem coming up here, and that's a nice a nice line there that happened by accident, didn't it? And so we can put in another another one like that, perhaps. And then. Um, I think here we've got this wonderful teasel shaped thing. So we'll put in a stem here too. So that's, that's that. And there are lots of nice circles which could be transformed. But what we need to do is build up some kind of, oh look at this. Is. It looks a bit like roots, but it's uh, interesting texture. Okay, there's another one here coming up. Oh, and there's one here. That looks like another teasel, so that'll be in the background behind that one. Another one here. Okay, and I want to put um, a big sort of flower down here, so probably don't really need to, to draw that much, but just reserve that space. And we've got this nice textured sky there too. Okay, so um, just going to take a short break and I'll be right back. 
Okay, so for the stem, I think I'll have a little bit of green and a bit of brown for the stem of this one. We'll start with this one. And then I might just drop a little bit of sepia in along the edge. And the cool thing about that is when you do that, it just blends a little bit and gives a little bit of three dimensionality. And then where I did the pencils before, pencil marks before, I'm going to just draw in an indication. Now, last time we did seed heads like this, we did something with um, uh, cotton buds. But this time I'm going to do something with a sponge, a little piece of natural sponge. And I'm just going to pop in these things, which I know they're green on my original, but they won't stay that way for long. So I'm doing these in burnt umber. So that gives us a, a kind of um, random pattern. And then I'm going to drop in a little bit of sepia as well to give it some texture. And depth. Okay. So, so that's that. Maybe I'll pop a little bit more dark in here. This um, brush has got a nice sharp point, so it's very good for um, details. Okay, and so now still using burnt umber, I'm going to just drop in something here and uh, same, oh, it's a little bit of sepia perhaps, let that run to give us some um, shadows. A little bit of, um, uh, what do you call it, some frondy things here in uh, burnt umber and sepia. And then we'll do the same coming down the side edge of this one. And if you get a little bit of dry brush going on, that's nice too. If that happens more or less by accident paint's fairly thick then you'll get a, a dry brush effect which is nice. Okay and we were going to do another one of those weren't we over here.
and that's what I mean by dry brush just not using terribly much water it gives you a bit of texture I quite like this brush for this kind of thing. It's got a very nice point and it does hold quite a lot of paint. So that's really quite good. Don't keep running out. Okay. Um, and then we've got another spiky one over here, haven't we? You'll notice as you see the paint drying how, uh, how it lightens up and you have to keep going back and adding another layer quite often. Um, but anyway, so I think that's probably enough at this point for those things. And um, what I'm going to do now then is have a go at doing some kind of flower down here. So I'm going to start with quinacridone gold and painting in the petals. Using the shape of the brush strokes to give me what I need. Down the bottom here, we're going to have some kind of leafy thing. And I um, don't want to play around with that too much. You want a variety of light and dark. And then maybe I'll do a pink one using Potter's Pink with a bit of gold, quinacridone gold. Maybe I'll do one over here. Here's an opportunity for the Amethyst Genuine, if I can get that to mix up. I shouldn't really use this brush to activate the paint, but I'm going to put in something back here. Where I already had some violet, and we'll put some 
gold in the center there. A little bit. Another one there. Maybe one here in the background. So wherever I can see um, a colour coming forward, that's where I'm going to put more of it. And we'll put something blue here. So that's that's the next step is to start building the colours behind. So we're just going to let that blend in. Here. And back here we've got um, orange again, haven't we? So um, we can probably risk that. And I'm going to go for Now I want to put in some berries. So I'm going to put them here where these funny little stems are. Seems to make sense. So I'm going to put a nice little cascade of berries and I'm just dropping them into where I've made it wet. And I'm going to let that kind of um, blend and then I'll sharpen the shapes up once that's dried a bit. And we are getting to a point here where I'm going to have to let it uh, dry somewhat. And uh, But I'm thinking in the background here, we probably need more uh, shapes. I'm not quite sure what shapes I want to put back there yet. So I'm gonna think about that. Use the um, amethyst a bit more to intensify some of these areas. Nice contrast with the gold the green and the purple. I need to let that dry. So now I'm going to um, paint in some some um, stems coming in from the top. Following some of the random lines that had already created themselves there. And uh, I'm going to stick with the the idea of brown and sort of just drop in some some leaves something like hawthorn leaves greenish brown and also um, some berries
And then down here, um, where we've got these shapes, I'm going to I'm going to leave some of them blurry and sharpen up a few of them. And then I'll take the, the tip of my um, my brush and create a few stems. And I'm trying to decide whether or not to do something up here. It looks a little bit empty. Not sure at the moment. Oops. And this wants to be bigger. And here I think we need some more bright petals. And that needs to dry. Just bringing some of these into a bit more shape, really. And maybe a little bit more shadow on some of these too, perhaps. And it's at this point really that I would probably put this aside until tomorrow because um, often, and this is you know good advice in general, often um, I don't know if it's to do with the drying process or what it is exactly, but quite often a painting will look significantly different the next day from what it does to you right now. So, and uh, so that's, that's often a good idea 
if you're not quite sure. And um, if you see something that you don't like that you've done, for example, I think this is too dark. So I'm going to try and lift that out. And if you've used reasonably good paper, often 100% cotton doesn't lift out very well. So that's one of the reasons I suggest cellulose because that will lift out. So if something's gone a bit dark and didn't dry back perhaps as much as you thought it would, uh, you can, so this is actually really quite useful probably demonstration. It also, a lot of artists do this on purpose, they do it deliberately to give themselves more variation in color. Because when you do lift out like this, you brush the water in, and then the, if you use um, paper towel, then you get something of a printing effect. So you leave a, a texture behind, as well as lifting it up, putting the paint off. And here's another thing. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I'm going to try. I'm not sure I want as much texture in the sky up here as I've got. I'm not quite sure whether I like that now, having done the rest of the painting. So first of all, I'll try to lift some of it out. I don't know if that's going to work because it's been there for a while. Not really. So the other thing I might be able to do is um, quieten it down a little bit perhaps with some more blue, especially uh, that's going to clean, I don't like green. Especially in the top corner, maybe. Not sure, we'll see, see how that dries. And I think I've got probably a little bit too much texture here. So again, you can blot it out. This is often the bit that the tutors on here don't show you. They don't show you the alterations that they make between painting it in and finally showing you the final product but you get me warts and all. I also don't much like this so I'm going to try and blend that that's better as I say a lot of artists professional not like me they do do this they uh, paint in fact I've seen a few people on YouTube doing it actually put a vast amount a lot of a lot of paint on and then wash most of it off which is absolutely very great for the paint manufacturer isn't it that's another thing about Ron Ranson actually I was talking about him the other day when I was doing my version of one of his paintings um, something always stuck in my mind and I don't I didn't actually follow this advice I don't because he said and he, because he painted so loosely and with such big brushes, and he always painted on 16 by 12 inch paper. Um, and he only ever used Cotman. He only ever used student grade paper. And he said it was perfectly okay, perfectly good enough for him. And there have been many artists since who have said, well, if it was good enough for him, then it ought to be good enough for me. So, but I tend, to somewhat disagree with that. Who am I to disagree with the great Ron Ransom? But it's just the colours are stronger with the artist's paints, which is nice. And if, but if you can't afford it, and lots of people obviously can't, then Cotman is fine.
I think I'm going to have to bring something in on this side too. wet in wet, somewhat vague, let it out a little bit, so most of our, color, our light's coming down the centre there. And we might want to think about spatter. Um, We might, I don't know, we can see, what shall we do? No, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to follow my own advice. I'm going to go and have lunch, because it's one o'clock. And, um, come back and see what that looks like once it's dry. So it's now completely dry and um, at this point I do need to rub out any um, superfluous pencil lines which um, I don't need, so that's why they're superfluous. Uh, some of them were guidelines that I didn't use so they won't be covered with paint at all and uh, taking those off is obviously going to improve things significantly and then in a second or two once I've done that I'll show you something else that's going to improve things significantly and um, that you have to do really at this point in a painting when you are designing as you go along. So unlike what you might do if you are um, uh, what's the word, um, just producing a um, piece of work which you've carefully planned out ahead of time and then you're going to actually create it, which of course you can do, absolutely, but it's not quite my style. So I'm just brushing off onto the floor where I will later pick it up with the vacuum cleaner. Here comes Arthur. Um, just brushing it off with an old um, shaving brush, which is nice. It's a, a new old shaving brush. Thank you, Sylvia. Very useful. I've got two of those and they are very handy. So you can see straight away that this looks quite a lot lighter once the pencil marks have gone. And uh, I'm just coming in there with fairly energetic um, energetic erasing of superfluous graphite on there and there we come with the oh here's Arthur say hello Arthur Arthur what are you doing Yes, he's a pickle, isn't he? What do you think? I tell you what, I'll just walk all over it. Come on. Um, where was I? <clears throat> yes, there we are. So we have got a painting now with no pencil on it. And this is the thing we need to do. You get yourself a mount and just pop that on. And I guarantee that you will see Oops, 
that the painting is uh, significantly improved by the removal of the tape and all the gubbins around the outside. And then the thing is, you can, at this point, you can say to yourself, okay, that's fine, that's good enough, that was a reasonable experience and I'm going to call it a day. Or you might say, I'm going to try a small amount and see if I don't like this. Rather than carrying on working with it, maybe there are bits of it that you really do like, so you take that mount away, or you can leave it there if you like, and then just put another one on top. It depends on what you feel like. You can, you could do that, and you could say, yes, I really, oops, I really like that bit. Don't like that bit so much, or, or whatever. <coughs> Don't eat flies. That's the thing. Don't eat flies, Arthur. <laughs> He's just caught a fly and decided to choke on it, so that's great. Um, yeah, so anyway, I think uh, the design is fine. And uh, what I'm going to do now, having decided I don't want to do any more painting, or at least not much, I'm going to grab some ink. And I want a dark brown. This is Sennelier uh, Walnut, Walnut Brown. And there's going to be a few little fiddly things that I'm going to fiddle around with. And I'm going to try my um, glass pen again. Last time I tried to use this on top of a painting I'd already done, it didn't work very well. But. Uh, We'll see this time. That's working fine. I think it was just dirty. What had happened, I think, was that the ink had stuck in the um, grooves and uh, I couldn't really see that. And then Tamsin, my daughter, had a look and she said, yeah, it's just dirty. So I think that was what it was. You don't have to use um, a dip pen of any sort. You could use, um, you know, a, a Faber-Castell or one of the other types, which are more controllable. This has a fairly, uh, what you could call random hit or miss. But I wanted to put in some dark areas, really. Most paintings look better if they are a mixture of soft areas like these fuzzy areas and sharper, more defined areas like this. They don't have to be uh, in any way accurate, but just more in focus, really.
you could put a, a blob in the middle like that and then just drag out some of your stems and then this ink is very, whoops oh Arthur this ink is very thick you can see it leaves um, a trace when you scratch it that's like watercolor does so that's quite nice Keeping one eye on the cat. He's on the printer now. Okay, I think that might be enough ink. I think I might just very, oops, I won't dip my paint, uh, paint, paintbrush into my tea. make these a little bit darker. Put our mount on it again. I think there's just one thing I think would be a good idea. And I'm just going to find my rigger if I can. Here it is. And I might put a little bit of white ink. You've got a few options when it comes to white ink. You've got uh, the PH uh, Martins white ink. You've got white gouache. You've got this one, which is uh, Winsor & Newton white. I don't really know what that's for just to break it up a little bit. And we could also spatter a little bit of brown or something, but I think I've probably come to the point where I want to stop now. So 